welcome to MBS True Review and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norma Sando. Joining me today is Silver Quill. Inconceivable. I'm on a podcast. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Probably. I might be a little drunk. On love. <laughs> what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. <laughs> So, anywho, in today's episode review, we are going to review... Well, it's been a while, and usually if we're not reviewing ponies, we are reviewing Ladybug. But not this time around. This time around, we are going to review the cult classic, The Princess Bride. Uh, The Princess Bride, directed by Rob Rayner, based on the book The Princess Bride by William Goldman. So yes, we are going to review that movie. Also, this episode review is sponsored by Lurker Cat. Thank you so much for suggesting this to us to review. So anywho, Silver, let's do what we always do in this type of situation and first impressions. Yes. Well, this movie is a curiosity because in so many ways it shouldn't work. The whole thing is basically Rescue Buttercup. That's all you do through 90% of the movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it should feel kind of boring or a cliche adventure. It's got all the tropes. And yet because it has such fun with them, because it has these great characters and quotable lines, and maybe you are, we are put in the the mindset of uh, Fred Savage's character. We don't care. It's just so infinitely fun and quotable and lovable as a result. I think that's where you just have to stop making an appeal to novelty. Yeah, yeah, true that, true that. And uh, I don't know, I've always heard of The Princess Bride before, but never really seen it before. Well, obviously, uh, I've seen this movie uh, once or twice before doing this review. But yeah, I've always been in that boat where I've heard of it. I've seen... Spoonie, I seen the critic, I seen Linkara use snippets from the movie, and I also remember you saying the word marriage, uh, marriage, something like that. Yes, so yeah, um, all of the greats use it. So I have to find out for myself, especially the line, um, that the famous line, that, that famous line, is "Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die." So it's like this is kind of a thing that I need to know, and. Once I saw it, it is awesome. It is an awesome movie. Like you mentioned before, Silver, this movie should have not worked. But somehow, god dang it, it did. And um, watching the IMDb page, it says that it was nominated for one Oscar. And other seven win and eight nominees. So yeah, that that's awesome. Did it win the Oscars? Uh, nominated, let's see, um... Academy Award USA 1988 nominees Oscar Best Music uh, winner uh, Academy of Science Fiction Fantasy and Horror Films USA 1988 winner Saturn Award Best Fantasy Film um, what else did it won nominee 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 winner um, Heartland Film 1987 winner Truly Moving Picture Awards yes uh, there's some there on the list if you want to check it out. If we were to go on talking about it, it would be, you know what? I'm just going to say the Academy has never been kind towards science fiction fantasy. It always seems to turn its nose up. You had to do the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy before they got an award. Awards, clean sweep. Apparently, you can you can date a fish and get an Academy Award, but oh, have a sword fight? No, no award for you. Or... You could, what you would call this, you know what, I, I'm thinking about Suicide Squad versus what movie was it again, and uh, you know what, that, that's, that's besides the point, that's besides the point. Um, getting back on track, The Princess Bride. So, what is The Princess Bride? Um, according to IMDb synopsis here, while homesick in bed, a young boy's grandfather reads him a story called The Princess Bride. Simple enough. So, uh, Silver, before we officially start... Uh, how do we want to do this? Because I'm thinking scene by scene and we can, you know, snip what we don't really need or teams. W- what's your point of view in this one? I think scene by scene will work. All right, then. Scene by scene is always good for me because, yes, I know how to do it. <laughs> so, anywho, if you guys at home are interested in this story, go watch it now. I highly recommend go watch it. Like, if you are listening to this, stop or pause it here. 
go watch The Princess Bride first, then come back and geek out with us. How did you like it? It was awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. So, anywho, anywho, we start off the movie with our hero, Fred Savage, the boy. Uh, did they say the name of the character? I don't think so, right? No, I think he's just the boy. <laughs> Wait, I'm getting a Kratos moment. I know. Boy! <laughs> listen to this story, boy! Yeah. Pay attention as you get better, boy! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As you wish, boy. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, we, we get to see our main character, boy. <laughs> I'm going to call him Fred. So, we get to see our main character, Fred, um, in bed, playing the Commodore 64. I think that's a Commodore. I'm not 100% sure. And I don't have those kind of um, game console before. So, he's playing baseball on the TV. And his mom comes in and checks up on him, saying, How are you feeling? Are you feeling better and whatnot? And, yeah... Fred here just says, oh, I'm, I'm doing okay, I mean, recovering and whatnot. And mom says, grandpa's coming here because uh, he knows that you're sick and he wants to cheer you up. And Fred here, like any other kid, says, oh man, no way, that's boring, boo. Boo, boo. Hey, boo, boo. Oh yeah, and also grandpa always pinches my cheeks. <laughs> yeah. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. But before we hit on, I have to point out, this kid's room is awesome. In terms of um, the deco style for this room, uh, the set guy, he did really awesome on this one. Because you can really tell that this is a kid's room. Well, not really, but yes. It is. Uh, it shows that it is a kid's room by the toys at the back. You, you get to see uh, He-Man, Cap, uh, his lion, Tiger, the green tiger thing, I forgot his name. And some other kid... Oh, per- uh, Battle Cat. Yeah, Battle Cat. And some other kid... Per- 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 How do you say that word, Silver? Well, see, I, I need to see an image of this. It's not It's not that. It's like paraphernalia? Yes, paraphernalia. Oh, per- well done. Thank you. So we get to see stuff like... Yeah, he, he's a fan of the Chicago Cubs. And he likes baseball. And he has a banner of New Mexico. You know what? We're getting off track. So anywho, uh, Grandpa comes in. Uh, Pinch cheeks and yay, uh, hands him a present. I- I'm going to give you the floor for a while to speak because I'm going like this for a mile an hour. Well, it- it's a book. And of course, this kid is like, I don't like books. Reading is dumb. Reading is for nerds. And Rainbow Dash is off on the side like, I thought that too. <laughs> but uh, let's see here. How to describe this. Basically, this is the story that, that this family reads to one another when they're sick. Uh, my fa- my grandpa read to me when I was sick. Uh, my dad read it to your father when he was sick. Oh, I'm going to read it to you while you're sick. Mm-hmm. So keep being sick. I don't want to spoil the tradition. <laughs> I-, I think it'll pass on while uh, if Fred has a kid, he'll read it to his kid and whatnot. Yeah. So anywho, Fred here says, you know what? Okay, okay grandpa, I stopped playing the video games and you can... Read me a story. I, I'll try and listen. So, yeah. Um, but before that, Fred asks, what kind of story is this? Like, is it going to be a romance story? I don't know. Like, oh, no, I, I don't like those. And Grandpa says, you know, this is a story all about a guy who... I'm trying to sing The Fresh Prince, but it's not coming in my head. But anyway, uh, the story is about... Oh, sorry? Now this is a tale all about how my life got flipped, just turned upside down. Just wait a minute and let me tell you a story. Oh, well. So, anywho, we are so white. <laughs> we are, but I, I think I'm even whiter. Are we going to have a white off? Hey. <laughs> so, anywho, Grandpa explains that, oh, this story has sports, action, fighting, romance, uh, murder, and stuff, and all the cool things that you want in a story. Oh, yeah. And Fred says, oh, okay, I, uh, I'll try and listen. So, yeah. Grandpa put on his reading glasses and tells a story about how this one beautiful maiden named Buttercup, no relation to the Powerpuff Girls, goes, travels the land. I won't say travel. He has... I'm a bit confused on this one. Does she live on the farm or what? Well, she's the owner of the farm. Ah, all right. She is lesser landowner, I guess. And Wesley, who is just her stable boy... And boy, she does not kind to him. At first. Apparently he's into that. Yeah, at first. And uh, Buttercup says like, Boy, shine 
this title. I want to see my face on it. And Wesley says, as you wish. And this keeps going on uh, from the saddle thing to the wood chopping and so on and whatnot. And we discover a scene where uh, Buttercup kind of has feelings for Wesley. And so does Wesley. Because every time when Wesley says, as you wish, it means I love you. And that is the healthiest relationship you can imagine. Yes. I, I'm starting to think... Uh, Wesley probably just likes being abused. That just sounds wrong. Oh, he, he's just playing the hard to get kind of game, you know? I don't know. I mean, is it, as you wish, is that the safe phrase? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. So, anywho. Yeah, it's like, stop, stop ruining the classics, Elmer. <laughs> yeah. So, anywho. But the couple and Wesley here profess their love for one another and, they're, and they kiss. Suddenly, we get to see Fred here says, oh, whoa, did. Kissing you, that sucks. You, I, I don't like kissing. Kissing you, you, that sucks. And so his grandpa's all like, "Okay, fine, we'll skip it. Let's go where he's killed by pirates." And I love, I love Fred Savage's commentary throughout this. Killed by pirates is cool. <laughs> yeah. So anywho, um, getting back on track, uh, we see Buttercup saying goodbye to Wesley. And was he saying, no problem, babe, I'll be back. I'll just need to earn some cash so we can live together happily because I'm a farm boy. Like, you ain't going to get true happiness from a farm boy. But I'm going to work my way up and earn some cash, yo. Hey, yo, yo. <laughs> yeah. But like any other story, there has to, they got to be some bad news. And we learned that Wesley's ship was invaded by the pirate Dread Roberts. What is his name? Dread Roberts? Yep, the Dread Pirate Roberts. Yes, the Dread Pirate Roberts. He's invaded his ship, and everybody knows that the pirate Dread Roberts, he don't uh, hold no prisoners. He slaughtered them all. Yar, yar. And with that, but the cup falls into depression. Oh no. I will never love again. Oh no. Well, if she doesn't feel love, the prince of the town does and proclaims Buttercup as his future bride to be. And there we have our title, Princess Bride. Huzzah! Yay! So it goes on for a while where Buttercup here is emotionally struggling and depressed about the whole situation thing about wesley but hey what do you have to do right i mean you have to move on so she she doesn't really find happiness except for writing and she loves to write uh, being in the wild sorry uh, riding the horse being all around the countryside and whatnot so she she loves doing that it, it brings her joy suddenly she crossed upon a group of travelers asking her if there's any location or, you know, closest town or something like that. And she says that, uh, no, there, there, there's no close town. So you have to walk a while before you can find anything. And with that, our princess, Princess Buttercup, gets kidnapped by the trio. Who is his name? The Sicilian? Yeah, the Sicilian. Vivian. Vivian. Um, V-I-Z-Z-I-N. Vivian, hmm. Finnick, and Inigo. Everyone knows Inigo. Yes. All right, so Vizini and Fezzik and Inigo. Yes, Vizinian, all right. So um, those three goobers kidnap the princess and they want to kill her at the... Um, where? Basically, they want to start a war uh, by killing the princess or the pure, uh, future princess at the... Uh, which we call this... Um, well, it's not revealed until later who hired Yeah, them. but it says uh, Gildir Front uh, Frontlines. Gil, Gildir, mm -hmm. yeah. He wants to kill the princess and put the corpse in the Gildir Frontlines while also <coughs> framing the Gildians that they kidnapped the princess and whatnot. He just wants to start a war, that jerk. There are some quotes from the book that may not have made it into the movie. I think this is one of them. I don't like killing a girl, the Spaniard said. God does it all the time. If it doesn't bother him, don't let it worry you. <laughs> That's not in the movie. I, I, I remember. That's not, but it's, it's in the book. It's in the book. That's dark. 
Oh wow. So anywho, uh, before we carry on, we get to point out the characters. Oh, the actors playing them. Yeah, I, I usually don't worry. I I find it funny that Andre the Giant plays uh, Physic. Yes. But all these guys do a fantastic job. And I'd argue that the, what we're about to go over is where the movie really wins most people. Oh? The most memorable stuff, the most loved scenes, are all the Dread Pirate Roberts versus the, the three bandits. Yeah, that's true. But before that, I, I have to say that the interaction when the three of them are on the ship and uh, Vizini calls uh, Finnick an idiot and he's hurt by that and Inigo just says Yo, it's cool man it's cool like don't let it, don't, don't let him get you down like let's let's see if you can drop some beats yo and they rhyme and you know what Physic kind of gets it uh, gets it right and he can really drop some beats yo do you think there are rapids up ahead if there are we'll be dead <laughs> oh wow no more rhyming I mean it <laughs> Would anyone like a peanut? <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That, that is just awesome. That is just awesome. So, and he'll, uh, wait, what's that? <coughs> yeah, we, we can tell that this, um, the, the, the two of them, like, um, Physic and an Eagle here are okay with each other while, uh, Vivian, uh, <laughs> I am having a hard time saying his name. You keep calling. Sorry? You keep calling him, you keep calling him Vivian. <laughs> And all I think of is uh, this British comedy, The Young Ones. Or it's, it's it's a rare name that I haven't heard that much. Uh, Vizian. Vizini? Vizini. 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 Yeah, <laughs> Without the... Say it with me, like, really slowly, just to be annoying. Viz- Vizini. All right. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So, anywho, um, our heroes or our villain here sail away, going to the foreign country, and Inigo spots something from behind them and saying that, yo, um, I think someone's tailing us. Uh, Vizini says, that's inconceivable. There's no one following us. Why do you say that? He asks. And Inigo just says, oh, nothing. I, I just noticed some, something behind us and it looks like it's following us. And with that, uh, moment of distraction, the princess jumps overboard trying to flee for her life. There's a strange sound coming from the waters, and I don't think it's the sirens. No, um, it's not uh, Adagio, Aria, or Sonata. They're they're not there. I think. Ah, uh, that'd be fun. That'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, but instead the uh, lake or the uh, is it is, does it state where they are or do I, I think there's just sea water, right? Just water, as far as I know. And they state that the waters are infested by man-eating eels. Yeah, so they got to fish her out post-haste. Because she needs to die, but in just the right way. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, but so, Vizian, uh, I, I need to look at that. Wow. V- Vizini. <laughs> oh, darn it. You're like a friend of mine who was trying to do a, uh, a Comic-Con interview. He... he Interview the silk author, and no matter how many times he uh, he said her name, he just couldn't get it on screen. It took like fifteen minutes to get him to nail it down. Uh, sorry about that. It's just that I need to look at the name because it's a very rare name for me. Uh, so anyway, uh, Vizini says, "Come back to the ship. I promise you won't die." <laughs> yeah, right. So anywho, uh, but before that, Vizini says to Inigo, "Go jump in." And Inigo says, um, I-, I can't swim. And Phoenix says, um, I only do doggy pedal. <laughs> In my mind, just looking at the, uh, and un- un- just looking at Andre the Giant do- doing the doggy pedal thing is just so adorable. Well, it'd be-, it'd be interesting to see. Oh, Andre the Giant, rest in peace. Yep, rest in peace, big guy. But before, uh, the lot can save them, we see an eel coming towards Buttercup, trying to eat her. Oh no! The horror! Ah! I don't know. I think I'm... I think all the eels in the answer are like, yeah, get a decent meal. This is cool. <laughs> oh no. Uh, but but before we can see the reveal, the kid goes screaming and says, oh no, that's, what's gonna happen? Oh no! The, the princess can't be dead! 
the, the eels, shrieking eels. Yep. And yeah, the, the kid here, um, the kid here is just excited about the story and doesn't want the princess to die. And grandpa says, nah, the eel doesn't get hurt. I'm explaining to you because you look nervous. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, can I uh, interrupt with another quote from the, the original book? Sure, go ahead. Because, oh, and I guess the kid's name is Bill, although oh. he's never named in the uh, movie. In the movie. Mm-hmm. Although, well, now I want to read the book because of this quote. And that's when she put her book down and looked at me and said it. Life isn't fair, Bill. We tell our children that it is, but it's a terrible thing to do. It's not only a lie, it's a cruel lie. Life is not fair, and it never has been, and it's never going to be. Here's the grandpa reassuring this, the grandson, and it's never truly fair. Funny that you say that, because uh, that quote there was said in the movie, but not at this point. Really? I think I forgot it within the movie. Uh, he mentioned about it near the... Um, he, he said... I, I'm not 100% sure if it's specifically... Uh, that quote there, but he said it near the end where I, you know what, it's spoiler, but it's at a point where something happens. If I notice it, I'll point it out. But anywho. Well, there you go. I, I completely forgot that quote. <laughs> well, I, I just rewatched it today, so I remember that thing, but yes. So anywho, the, the kid is, well, kind of excited because Grandpa here is a really good storyteller. Grandpa just says, okay, let me continue the story. And Grandpa tells a story where Oh no, Buttercup's going to be dead. Oh no! Suddenly, a big hand swaps the or swats the eel and picks Buttercup up. So, yay! Awesomeness. Andre the Giant is a boss. Yay! And I will say, I, I love the, uh, I guess it would be animatronics or some sort of practical effects. Because that eel does look pretty terrifying as it zo- looms up with uh, its mouth. It's just a wiggling form and a mouth. It's it's almost alien. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, way back in the days, what, this was 1987? The, the, it's all practical effects, man. What, C- CG what now? What? Uh, CG would have ruined this. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things that this movie would be ruined nowadays. But anywho, but the cup was saved by Fizik, whatever his name is, um, and Vizini ties her up. So... After that, uh, it's daylight, and their ship is still following them. Vizini tells um, Frederick to get in gear and uh, climb up the mountainside. So it seems that uh, Physic here is a really big lumbering giant guy, hence Andre the Giant playing him, which is very poetic. So he's carrying an eagle, he's carrying uh, Vizini, and, she's all, and he's also carrying the princess up the mountain. And if you notice, right, Silver, um, the way that they show this scene, um, Andre doesn't really put his leg on the cliff wall. He's just carrying all of them with his upper body strength, which is his hand. Like, what? <laughs> well, that just shows how powerful he is. That's a good setup for the fight that's coming. Oh, yep, yep. Yes, we're about to engage in the fights. Yes, yes. So, anywho, um, I'm just going to skip forward a bit. We get to see um, a MIB, <laughs> the man in black, uh, climbing up the uh, climbing up the cliff wall, and uh, Vizini here says, "He's catching up. Why? Why can't you be fast?" And um, Physic here says, "Well, I'm carrying three people." Vizini says, "I don't want to hear any of your excuses." So they reach up the cliff wall, or they reach at the mountain top, and Physic here. Cuts the rope while the man in black is still there. Oh no. Someone's falling. I don't hear a boof. That's because the man in black, he is an expert wall climber better than Batman. Or Spider Man. He's the med- he's the medieval Batman. <laughs> don't even joke about that one, man. Yeah, as you wish. Oh god, no. So anywho, um, like Silver mentioned, the man in black, um before he fell. He kind of hugged the wall and is kind of surviving. So Vizini tells Inigo to deal with him. And Inigo says, sure, I can do it, but I'll be using my left hand. And here stating that by using his left hand, he's powering himself down. 
So Vizini says, yeah, whatever, as long as you kill him off. I don't care. All right. So Vizini, the princess, and also Andre, for the life of me, I cannot say his name. Uh, Physic? Physic, yes. <laughs> Physic uh, goes away and tries to get as far away from the men in black as possible. So yes, uh, we get to see Inigo really, really excited about the fight that's going to be happening. And he banters with the men in black. While the dude is climbing, that's... <laughs> I, I, I love how respectful they are. I mean, uh, we're so used to trash talk or demeaning the uh, opponent. And it's more just sort of them sort of acknowledging the situation they're in. You know, I, I think I would offer you a rope, but you will not take it and because I'm going to kill you when you get up here. That does put a strain on our relationship. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is where we get to the infinitely quotable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, what was this? I, I'm, I'm looking at this script here. So, yeah, Inigo just says, Hello there! Slow going! <laughs> and yeah, the man in black says, Look, I, I don't mean to be rude, but this is not as easy as it looks. So, I appreciate if you would distract me. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my goodness. They're so polite. Oh, my God. That's just awesome, man. There's some great back and forth with them. Uh, you know, uh, Inigo offers the rope and uh, he says, what if I offer you my, my pride as a Spaniard? No deal. I have no too many Spaniards. <laughs> and then when he, when he swears on the memory of his father and instantly uh, the man in black just says, give me the rope. Just like, Wow. Well, I wish we could see more of this in stories. Enough of this, oh, ho, I'm going to beat my chest and be the greater man. There's this mutual respect. They're going to fight, but there's this level of mutual uh, affirmation mm -hmm. that I so enjoy. It's what makes this so memorable. Yeah, this fight scene, is, it is, okay. the setup for the fight scene is awesome because from the very start, we... Can we know more of Inigo rather than the Man in Black? So we kind of rooting for Inigo here, but we do know that he is a crook, he is a scoundrel, and he's just doing it for the money. But the Man in Black, what is, does he do? We got no idea. Better the devil, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, their banter with the cliffside thing, and after the cliffside, Inigo keeps his promise. He doesn't stab him while he gets up. Even does the Man in Black take five and catches his breath. And you won't see that in shows today, like the whole setup of hero-villain dynamic where, okay, let's just talk before we get into action. Nowadays, it's all about the dramatic camera angles, the um, thumping music and whatnot, and it's, it's a lot of things in between that's wrong with modern-day storytelling. But if we were to go and describe the whole thing, blah, 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 we will be here till 5 a.m. or whatever it is. So yeah, uh, we're gonna Indeed. we're gonna speed it up a bit. So anywho, uh, after the man in black catches his breath, they start the duel, and I love this fight. This fight here is just awesome. Okay, obviously it's corny by today's standard with how much of the stage that you're using, and let's just say that modern day people will not find this entertaining. Oh, I think modern day people will still find this entertaining. The, there's a charm in how it looks and how it's shot, even how the set. You can tell the set is fake, and yet it's not trying too hard to look real, but it's not looking lazy either. True, true. And I, I also appreciate this because when you take a look, see at the fight scene, right? They play it off um, casually at first, and then it ramps up. There's a build up. And then there's a scene where uh, Inigo says, haha, uh, they're just comparing notes about, oh, I can do this, I can do that. Ha 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 ha. Look at my skills. Huzzah. Ha ha. And uh, Inigo reveals that you would think that I am something, something with my hands, but I am ambidextrous. I can use both hands. Ha ha. The dread pirate is like, why are you smiling? There's something I know that you do not. What's that? I am not left handed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also revealed. Then, Sorry, go ahead, Silver. Well, it's nothing you should know. I'm not left handed either. <laughs> Da, 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 da. Yeah, and they, they fight and they fight and then um, the man in black disarms Inigo but instead of stabbing him through the chest or anything he says he doesn't say it but he just gestures to go get your sword 
And they continue fighting. Like, wow, you, you can tell that both of these men have mutual respect for one another in their fighting abilities. And yeah, it's call it weird that it's sort of that idealism that no nobility among scoundrels mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that it is a fantasy but geez that's what makes it so endearing yeah yeah and during the end of the fight the man in black wins by disarming inigo and i, I think his sword is flown off way way off way off i mean it's disarmed him twice and uh and i love i love the man in black's line I'd sooner, I'd sooner shatter a stained glass window than deny the world your poetry. <laughs> yeah, and he knocks him out. Uh, and, and that that fight scene there was just awesome. Like, oh, standing ovation. That's why we follow up with this movie. So anywho, we catch up to um, Vizini and uh, Physic. Hey, you did, you did it. Well done. Yay. <laughs> so we, we catch up with Vizini and Physic and the princess. And Vizini says, you go hide and throw a rock. A big rock. <laughs> is that my style? <laughs> my style is not very sportsman. Yeah. So, we, we, over here we get to see that Physic uh, here is not... He, okay, he is a big lumbering giant, but he is a big lumbering giant with honor. So, he wouldn't um, sneak attack somebody. He, he wouldn't cheat. So, uh, let's... So, um, phys- Physic hides, and when the man in black comes, he throw a rock, a big rock. But misses intentionally. That's the other part I love. Mm-hmm. So they agree to fight like civilized men. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Physic here has the advantage because he's Andre the freaking giant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but still, the fight is not as high impact as it could be in modern shows. It's just simple. Like, you get to see the man in black trying his best to best Andre here. But because of the size difference and the sheer strength of Andre, the man in black is totally defeated here. But um, with some tactical speedy moves, the man in black gets behind Andre and chokes him out. Once again, just totally respectful. I hope you dream of large women. (laughs) Uh, yes, and the man in black chases after uh, Vizini, while at the cliff top we get to see some boots um, reenacting the fight scene. And at first, I thought this was Inigo, but it's revealed to be the prince. Yes, Humperdinck. Mm. What an unfortunate name. <laughs> yes, uh, but yes. So Humperdinck here and his right hand man are trying to rescue the princess. And it seems that Humperdinck here is, uh, well, he, he's very knowledgeable and can tell that, he can tell by this fight scene what happened. That is very amazing in his talent. Yeah, he, uh, what, what does uh, Buttercup say of him once he can track the wings on a hummingbird? I think a falcon on, on a cloudy day, something like that. Yep. So he, he's pretty awesome in terms of hunting and tactics. So they follow the trail, we cut to the man in black, and we get to see him chasing down uh, Vizini. And yeah, Vizini is just resting there on a rock, having some cheese and wine, while pointing a dagger at the princess. Oh no! And she doesn't say a word during this whole thing. I will say, as a female character, she's not terribly self-sufficient. Yeah, true. (laughs) But hey, um, it's a life or death scene, so she better be quiet and let it play out. So anyhow, um, Vizini mentions that, okay, uh, you bested my swordsman and you bested my giant. So um, it's not fair for me to fight you. So let me challenge you to a duel of the minds. And yes, the man in black here has a challenge and he shows uh, Vizini some poison and takes the two wine gauntlet to the side and poisons one of them. And this whole interaction here is just so good because the mind games that they're playing here are just too awesome. You you could just imagine this happening to us in real life. I don't know if I'd be this clever, though. <laughs> uh, or daring. Or daring. I mean, the dialogue is great. I, I felt bad that of all the characters, Vizini had to go. Yeah, but Vizini was a jerk. 
he was a jerk, but he was one of those jerks who's so <clears throat> over the top that it's not e- it doesn't even seem malicious. It's like he couldn't be anything else. He's just okay, he's just the idiot that thinks he's smart. <laughs> I rage, therefore I am. <laughs> yeah, Vizini decides to do the old uh, trick of look what's over there. <laughs> And yet he, he, he never realized, never let the other guy make the rules. <laughs> but, yeah, but at the same time, too, right, Silver? Like, for a smart guy, saying the word, look, what's over there? <laughs> well, so it's amazing how uh, often that works, especially in fiction. <laughs> I know. Uh, it reminds me of a scene in Hajime no Ippo, but oh, that's besides the point. Is it the point? So uh, switch the, switch the goblets, but uh, turns out they're both poisoned, yeah. and the way Vizini dies. <laughs> Thug. Oh wow! Oh uh, yeah, but um, the man in black mentions that oh, uh, they're both poisoned. I just have a tolerance for it, so yeah, I survive. And we cut back to the prince, and the prince sees the fight with the giant, and he noticed Vizini's dead body and whatnot. Yeah, so the the prince is. Get uh, getting close to the princess, so the man in black just strikes up a conversation with the princess and stuff, and he says that he's the dread pirate Roberts, and the princess here is angry at him because you killed my love, like oh how dare you and stuff blah 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 blah. So as they go on, princess here kind of pushes him off a cliff and tells him to go die something like that. As you wish. <laughs> <laughs> And then Buttercup comes tumbling after. Yep. Okay, here's the, here's the part where I don't understand. Like, okay, for the man in black, or in this scenario, it is revealed that the man in black is... Oh my god, I forgot his name. Uh, Wesley. Wesley, yes, thank you. So, it is revealed that he is Wesley. Oh no! And the princess says, Oh no, what have I done? You would have think that she would run down. No, 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 no. That, that would be the smart thing to do. No. The princess decides to do a spinball. What? I'll tell you, dude, going down a hill that steep in a dress, you're going to end up tripping and falling no matter what. She was just cutting out the middle. Man. <laughs> and in many ways, you know, a sonic spinball. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we, we get to see that um, the princess or these, okay, the stunt people for this, they're just awesome because that tumble looked like it hurts. Ouch. But in some ways, this is where we hit the part of the movie where I feel like the energy really throttles down because there's this great swamp mm. dangerous swamp yes and there and there's there's a menace but because it's just feral creatures there's none of the fun banter uh in the duel with Inigo or with Fezzik or certainly not with Vizini mm-hmm. so in some ways I propose that we sort of hit the fast forward and get to well after fighting the R.O.U.S.'s <laughs> yeah which, again, that's one of the most famous scenes. <laughs> yeah, because in, in my mind, like, okay, I could always imagine this while playing D&D, right? Um, you're stuck in a swamp. And then the first thing, as a DM, you are going to say, roll for um, something. And then one body, somebody says, oh, uh, your character says, there's no such thing as R-O-U-S-S. Suddenly, a big red comes out. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, wow. This scene here is a bit slow, but it does set up the length that they're willing to go through to um, get away from this and live happily ever after. Because, well, uh, it has been said that nobody survives going through the swamp of flames or something like that. Yeah, the flame swamp. Yeah. But uh, you're only saying that because no one ever has. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's a smart line. Uh, so blah 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 as we go on um, blah 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 they, they survive they survive after the whole battle with the R.O.U.S.S. and they can hold their breath a really long time under that quicksand yep. <clears throat> but but here here's what I mean that that after the swamp when they get captured that's all the energy goes out because for a while there we're in sort of this limbo as characters kind of work their way into the right roles or that you set up the pieces for the finale mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and 
and it's a rough go for a while. True, but I, I think it builds tension. It's 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 like a roller coaster, right? Like you have to go up and down for a bit for the tempo. At the first, you it was slow until the fight, and then it has to slow down a bit to make your audience relax for a bit before the climax, which is going to be the third act. So we reach the end of the flaming swamps, and the prince catches up with them and asks them to surrender, or specifically us, Wilson? No, not Wilson. Uh, Wesley. Wesley, yes. Uh, ask Wesley to surrender. Wesley says, I rather die and whatnot, but the princess Sarah says, no, I'm not willing to go through that pain again. If we surrender, promise me that you'll let um, the py- Dread Pirate Roberts go away. And the prince agrees to this, while at the back saying to his right-hand man says, kill him or something like that. The princess and the prince goes back to the castle, and it seems that Wesley here knows more than what he said on to, because he says to the right-hand man that, don't lie, it's not becoming of you. We are both men of action. So he knocks him out, and yeah, we are led through the dungeon. Oh no. And this is where um, we get to see that they're not taking themselves seriously, because we get to see an albino, who has a raspy voice like this, until he clears his throat and then he speaks normally. <laughs> Which is pretty fun. I mean, you know, love it when they when they play on expectations. We also get sort of, this is where all the, the big plot reveals are, that who Humperdinck hired his thieves, and Humperdinck is trying to kill his pride. Just to start a war and whatnot. They never say why he wants to start the war. Does he want to claim the other country? I don't know. Maybe he's just power hungry and whatnot. He just wants to start war. But anywho, um, we get to see that Buttercup here is not happy with the whole arrangement and makes a deal with the prince saying that I, I want out of this. And the prince says, okay, um, how about this? You write four letters. I'll send out my four fastest ship to get in touch with the pirate and he, if he replies that means he's love you if not then well what about me right I, i'm still available so yeah the princess agrees and we get to see yeah uh, he he doesn't want to and th- this banter between the prince and the uh, left hand man here is awesome because the prince just says as much as i love watching you work i'm busy with the planning and whatnot, running a country, my own wedding, murdering the princess and whatnot. I, I, I'm a bit swamped. And the left man, man says, you just take care of yourself, bro. I, I got this. I got this. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we get to see um, the left hand man at his workstation. And uh, how, how do I want to describe this? Silver, why, why don't you take over for a bit? Well, it's a machine designed to take years off your life in a miserable way. And I will say Wesley really sells it when he turns on the machine and just screams and then whimpers afterwards. This is a guy who climbed a cliff face, uh, bested a swordsman, bested a giant, and survived the unsurvivable swamp. And even he is, uh, is, is reduced to whimpering. It shows that these guys are their own menace. And then he really sells it when they kill him. <laughs> yeah. All the screaming. But that's not yet. But anywho, we are back at the castle and we get to see the captain of the guards. Yay. He's not shining armor, but still. He goes to the princess's office because the princess called him there and saying that there's going to be an assassin going to come to my palace on the night of our wedding and kill the princess. I want you to go to the thieves' den and clean them out, put them in jail and whatnot. I don't care how you do it. I just want you to do it and whatnot. And with that, the next day, he darns do it. He captures everyone, put them in the cave and whatnot, and yeah, whatever. He just puts them in jail. And one of the guards' men says that, hey, uh, we have this one trouble with this drunk, so yeah, what are you going to do with it? And the captain of the guard says, do whatever you can, make his life miserable, yeah, whatever it is. And miserable junk is an ego. He's, well, he's defeated. He couldn't find the man who killed his father and whatnot. So he's going back to square one, being a drunk. Which leads to the best sobering up scene when, when uh, Fezzik finally finds him. Just dunking his head back and forth between water barrels. <laughs> like, 
Wow, that's either a really good wake up or really elaborate torture. If you notice, right, one of the water is hot. I don't think I can notice. It. Okay, if it's hot enough that it's steaming, you shouldn't be dunking a man in that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but still, um, <laughs> that wake up scene, that sobering scene, is awesome. But uh, <laughs> but at the same time, too, Pizzi here describes that the right hand man to the prince. He has six fingers on his hands. Like, oh, that's the guy that killed my father. Ah, gonna go. Gonna go get him. Ah. The chain of events here. Again, this is getting everybody into their positions for the grand finale. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of meandering. It's like, well, hang on. We've been following Buttercup and Wesley this whole time. And now they're they're separated. And there's this sort of sense of a void. You know, everyone's kind of just, just flailing through the void trying to get to where it's more secure. And thankfully, we, we have uh, Billy Crystal to help get to that. Yeah. The princess found out that he never sent a letter and whatnot. And he's pissed off because the prince will never love him. So he goes to the secret entrance and turns up the torture device up to 50. Oh, what the hell? That's going to kill a man. And with that, we hear his scream of agony. Best acting ever. Best death scene. Yeah, he certainly sold it. I, I was a little kid when I first saw this. And it's like, that scene was like... This isn't fun anymore. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yes, but still, uh, his scream of anguish can be heard from across the land. And Inigo and Physic notice it and chases uh, and follows the sound. They stumble upon the albino and Inigo says, Physic, jog his memory. <laughs> and by jogging his memory, he don't bonk him on the head a bit too hard that he knocks him out. There you go. Man can't measure his own strength sometimes. Mm-hmm. And with that, Inigo gets onto Wait. one knee and says a little prayer to his dad, saying, please guide me to uh, the land in black because it is a quest for vengeance and whatnot, blah, blah, blah. And after walking around for a bit, the tr- sword pierces a tree and Inigo is crushed and slumps upon a tree and Guess what? Set three is the entrance for the um, hidden chamber. Yay! Lucky! Yep. And they discover uh, Wesley dead. Oh no! And Silver, this is the part where that line was said. Oh, where the grandfather says to the son, life is not fair. Mm hmm. And yeah, yeah, it was that scene where, yep, you know what? You already mentioned it, so I'm not going to repeat it. Well, and it, it it does show how the son, how the grandson is getting so upset. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's funny that in the book the pronoun was she, so I wonder if in the book the mother is reading the princess bride. Um, no idea. In any case, rescue. I forget. Do they knock out? They knock out the albino as well, don't they? Yep, because um, Inigo mentioned uh, jog his memory, and uh, Andre here knocked him a bit too hard. <laughs> so yeah. So I forget he was on the outside. I thought that was a guard. No. I get mixed up sometimes. No, because the place is super secret. Nobody knows except for the prince, the left-hand man, and the albino. So Inigo asks how many coins does the giant have. And they visit the Miracle Worker, which is played by Billy Crystal? The idol? Yes, indeed. Come back with the Brute Squad. <laughs> I'm on the Brute Squad. You are the Brute Squad. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Inigo knocks and then, yeah. Uh, with, with a bit of reluctance, the Miracle Man allows him in and checks on him and whatnot. He says that he's not dead, but he's not alive. He's in the between and stuff. So He's mostly dead. <laughs> yeah. So this is the part where he takes a... Oh, what, what do they call that device, Silver? I don't really remember. Oh, oh yes, the uh, the bladder. The vowel. Yeah, yeah. Put it in his mouth, put him on air, and then uh, decipher what his word was, or what his thing was. This, and he says, "Oh wow, <laughs> oh wow." And of course, the Billy Crystal, uh, who played the his the Witch of the Wife. Oh man, Billy Crystal is Miracle Max. Uh, Carol Kane <laughs> as Valerie, Max's <laughs> wife, and, and the way that she just keeps guilting him <laughs> into doing this. Chasing her around and it's like <laughs> revenge. Hey, revenge! I can get behind. Yeah. I mean, they're they're just as you're getting uncomfortable as how everything seems to be adrift. Here's these two just bringing this wonderful comedy dynamic, and 
basically, I think, pulling the audience back. I think without their humor, the middle of this would have suffered a great deal more. Yeah, and in a in a modern day show, those two would be overplayed and will be so annoying. But over here, they're not. They're just uh, how do I put this? They they're playing the right amount of annoyance where it's it's not going too overboard with their annoyance. You know what I mean, right, Silva? I, I think I know what you mean. I I don't know. We're kind of playing the what if game here, where maybe a modern day take on this could do it just as funny. It's just that lately, I think we've seen a lot of bad humor. Now, uh, Marvel, I mean, if you brought the talent that Marvel movies have with their, their dynamics. Mm-hmm. I think you could still find something comparable, but this this is all just immortal. This movie has is is timeless, yeah. despite <laughs> as you said, like the very time specific set pieces on uh, the grandson's room. Yeah. But the main story itself is forever timeless. Yeah, it doesn't really matter because even if you okay, the timepiece on the grandson's room is well retro at best, but if. If somebody were to edit the film in a modern day setting with smartphones and tablets and cut the scene here in between them and reenacting it, it still works. But anywho, um, let's get back on track. It seems that uh, the miracle worker got some cure to get Wesley up and running, but it takes time before it gets uh, before Wesley gets full effect of his body because reasons so they caught up the cliff wall and whatnot and scout out what's happening and it seems that there are more than 30 men guarding the door so right now Inigo force feeds Wesley the medicine and in a gif he kind of woke up oh wow and I like this scene here the banter between the two uh, the all three of them Inigo saying, oh, you're up. And Wesley saying, okay, what do we have? Um, my swordsman skill, his strength, your brains. I can't use anything. Uh, and when Wesley mentions, oh, I wish we had a barrel, uh, a wheelbarrow. And Andre says, oh, uh, we had a wheelbarrow. Where, where, where do you put it? Oh, back to the albino. <laughs> Wesley just schools him. Why didn't we uh, list that down in our assets? <laughs> <laughs> It's hard. To, it's hard to work with this crew sometimes. Even, <laughs> even mutual respect can only get you so far. Yes, but I just love the scene where uh, the actor playing Wilson here is just awesome. This scene here, he just been resurrected from the dead. He doesn't have his full um, motor skills yet, so he wants to see what's going on. Andre just uh, holds him up and he and <laughs> just moves his head like a puppet, like. <laughs> This is just so awesome. Oh, wow. Well. Wowzy, wowzy. And then the reason for the wheelbarrow. Mm-hmm. I just love, I love Andre the Giant as he as he storms as an even greater giant. Mm-hmm. And says he'll bring death to them all and whatnot. <laughs> Much awesomeness. And yeah. And Much awesome. In between all of that is the wedding scene. <laughs> uh, with, with the most quotable clergyman in history. Mawaj. Mawaj is what boings us together. There's no purpose to this. The, the, his his speech impediment does not serve any plot points. It's just funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it works so well. So very well uh, to make it endearing and timeless. Again, immortal story. Uh-huh. It's just like, wh- why the speech impediment? <laughs> and uh, Humperdinck's uh, ins- uh, insistency on speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. So, anywho, let's see. Wesley's plan was to set Andre on fire and scare the um, guards away, which works. And, yay, Humperdinck says, uh, get to the end where husband and wife and whatnot, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he does that and, yeah, uh, marriage is marriage done. Oh, well, Buttercup is, like, dumbfounded by this and decides to kill herself. She kisses the king and says that, oh, you, you were always nice to me. And the king here is a big idiot. <laughs> He doesn't. He doesn't get uh, what's go- about to go down. Yep. He doesn't grasp his son's ambitions, but that's okay because we have the best trio of invaders, <laughs> yeah. uh, j- just going at it. But then, then they uh, they split up. <laughs> it's like 
this is basic role play. You never split the party. Yeah, yeah. But, do not split the party. But the way that this happened was just awesome. Um, the guards confront the heroes, and uh, the the right hand, sorry, uh, the right hand man says, "Sorry, the left hand man." You know what? I'm just going to call him the six fingered man because uh, he's the bad guy. He's the six fingered man. They know who he is. Yes, okay. He mentions the guard, kill the giant, kill the man in black, but leave the Swordsman for questioning. And Inigo here has skills, yo. He cut down four guards with his sword skill. And oh, here is the legendary line. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And instead of fighting like a man, the six-fingered man runs away! Runs away! <laughs> but it's such a, it's such a perfect <laughs> boom. Instant run. You're just like, okay, I love it. I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the eagle runs. And not only that, uh, the six finger man locked himself in a door. And the way the, the tension, the build up the stress you can see from Inigo's face, um, showing that, uh, showing, showing him trying to break down the door and calling for Andre to break it down. It's like, you can see that, like, wow, that is just acting, man. Like, oh. And that, of course, has the scene to split the party even further. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so Inigo chased down the man, uh, the man with the six fingers, and the man with six fingers is getting ready. He pulls out a throwing knife, and once Inigo comes out of the corner, he throws the dagger to his gut, injuring him. You feel bad. You feel so bad for him as he's apologizing to his father. And you're like, ah, oh, no, I dare go. I don't want you to go the way of Vicini. With some kind of miracle, uh, he found the strength to counterattack and fight back. And he keeps um, screaming or he keeps mentioning uh, his quote, My name is Inigo Montoya. Uh, you killed my father. Prepare to die. As he fights. And the six-finger man says, Stop saying that. And before he dealt him the final blow, Inigo mentions that, Make me a deal. The six finger man says, "Okay, I'll give you money, wealth, whatever you want. I'll just give it to you." And with one swift strike of the sword, Inigo stabs the man who killed his father and says, "I want my father back." And poetic justice. Meanwhile, I I have to give mad props to Wesley, who somehow scaled the tower <laughs> without much motor control, <laughs> and he's just lying on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you got to inject just a little comedy. So gently, dearest. <laughs> I wonder what happened. <laughs> well, you know, she's giving him a hug and she's kind of smothering him at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but uh, Wesley noticed the prince behind holding a sword, trying, getting ready to kill them. But Wesley, uh, Wesley here is awesome. Through some wordplay, he gets the prince freaked out. And before anything, he says, too, that we will duel to the death. No. We will duel to the pain and proceeds to give this incredibly long narration, but he has everyone captivated. I was going to cut off his nose, pluck out his eyes, mm -hmm. uh, ba but basically leave everything but his ears untouched so everyone see he can hear how everyone reacts to this horror. And, and it culminates with this, drop your sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the prince just, he is done <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah oh my god i say that's a charisma roll of 20 there and a bluff of 20 on that on top of that too and oh wow with that um the prince does what he says uh sits down to the chair and buttercup ties him up and yeah wesley just collapsed and the prince says i knew it you i knew you didn't have the strength <laughs> But, uh, and everyone's just like, shut up! And now it is time for, uh, an escape. Yeah. A grand escape. Yeah, the grand escape. And the escape plan was, well, it's kind of silly because Wesley asks Inigo, um, where's Physic? And says, I don't know, I thought it was with you. No, I thought it was with you. Suddenly we get to hear, um, somebody scream for the both of them. And, yay, it's, Physic at the window or at the stable with four white horses and he explains that oh I was walking around and I saw these four white horses and I thought hey there's four of us and yeah this will be a great escape plan and uh, 
like, hey, that's awesome. Like, he's not that dumb. He's just awesome. And you get to see that in all of them. Like, they really appreciate Andre here. I love his says, Oh, Physic, you have done something smart. Don't worry. I won't <laughs> let it go to my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, the writing here is just awesome, too. Just for those things, man. So, uh, what else? Yeah. When they're going down, uh, Inigo says, You know what? For 20 years, I've been plotting my revenge. And once that's done, I got nothing, man. Like, what do I even do? And uh, Wesley here says, You know what? Pirating does suit you. What do you think about that? <laughs> Have you considered piracy? <laughs> and there's this great, there are these great images of them just jumping to the horses. It's so magical and it's the music, the slow motion movement. Mm-hmm. But here's where the book and the movie really divert. Ah, okay. Because in the book, it's not nearly so idealistic. They're fleeing. You can hear Humperdinck in pursuit. Uh, but Wesley starts to succumb. He's he's really, he used up everything. So he's about to pass out. Inigo is still, is bleeding. So he's starting to pass out. Physic gets confused and scared in the dark. So they don't know which way to go. And Buttercup doesn't know. I think I have to read the book, but I think this story ends on a cliffhanger. Oh, wow. I think that too. Um, here's one of the few other reasons why I wanted to pursue this uh, review. I've read a fan fiction on Filmfic about the story being, well, it's basically The Princess Bride, but told from a different perspective. I think it's from the book kind of deal, but yeah it kind of ends on a cliffhanger kind of deal. That's from the fan fiction, I'm not 100% sure. I know Master of Lag has been talking about this one too, uh, wanting to know the difference between, or wanting us to talk about the difference between the book and the movie. But in all honesty, I never read the book, so I got no idea. And you might one day read the book, right, Silver? I'm tempted now. Very much tempted. Okay, so... Uh, once you've done that, probably we'll do a quick look on the differences. You can tell me about it. But yeah, uh, myself, like if you're hearing this now, uh, do let us know what are the differences so we can compare later on when we do the follow-up for this uh, review. But still, anything more to add, Silver? Just that, well, I love the, the parting with the, the grandson and the grandfather, as you wish. And... It, we are like the, the grandson. I mean, go, you go into the story, especially as an adult, you're cynical and dismissive or maybe looking down your nose at it. Mm-hmm. And then this whole thing unfolds and you're just as captivated with the kid as he is when he's protesting that he's he's reading the wrong story. <laughs> yeah. And so I really love this movie. It's one of those movies you can watch just about any time, anywhere. Yeah, and this movie is one of those movies that you can watch with your uh, for me, in my case, nephew, uh, probably for you, older gentlemen or ladies out there with your kids and whatnot. Okay, there's mild violence with blood stain and whatnot. It was during the era. It's 1987, so you have to give it some slack. But it is a really good story. I highly recommend it. Um, well, yeah, uh, we, we're all over the place right now. So uh, Wesley and Buttercup kiss, happy ending, the end. Movie version. Movie version. So anyway, uh, let's go to final thoughts and probably a bit of discussion if warrant. So what do you think of this movie, Silver? Like, um, besides everything you mentioned before. Well, like I say, just love it. Love the acting. Love the characters. It's sort of simple and direct. And that's what we need. I, I, I hear what you're saying that modern modern cinema, we there's so much emphasis on shaky cam and close angles and really speeding up and sometimes it's just fun to see it unfold in one shot to just see the characters really showing their moves rather than uh this rapid cut and i wonder if perhaps we're in the pendulum where we've swung so far to this one style of cinematography will we suddenly see the pendulum swing back get to equilibrium and then go too far the other side and then we'll yearn for the fast pace editing once again The pendulum effect is in many, many, many things. True. I don't know, man. It's one of those scenarios where I see modern day movies have this bad habit of shaky cam, especially in um, wrestling. Like the fight scenes are hard to watch while independent or Japanese wrestlings show from afar and you can see what's going on. So 
it's similar to movies now when you watch action movies, especially the big budget one that came out like Jurassic World or even Ant-Man or Avengers and whatnot, they rely too much on shaky cam and close angles for you to not notice the mistakes that were going on. But older movies, they pride themselves on the fight scene because gosh darn it, our choreographers spent hours on it and we're going to show it right. It's just funny, just last night I watched North by Northwest. Oh? Alfred Hitchcock really made good use of long shots, to, even even if the compositing was very fake by our standards. He really he really knew how to build tension even with a long shot. Here's the thing. Um, old filmmaking relies on, rely on what they have at hand. And the thing is, film costs money. You do not want to waste film. While modern day, it's all digital. And you can fix it in post. Um, we can have our stuntmen be much safer and whatnot. And also we can do the whole CG thing. Look at Jar Jar. I'd rather not. <laughs> but nothing beats practical effects. And people of the olden days know what they were doing. <laughs> but I sound like an old fogey for loving olden cinematography. But it's true, man. Like old, Olden movies are much awesome. And this one is is a shining example. So if you haven't seen it in a while, give it give it another look because it, it's always worth revisiting. Yep, yep. And with that, movie ends and episode review ends too. Like this was a fun review. I I really enjoyed it. Like this is one of those. I am glad that I I took the chance and watched this movie. So yeah, it, it was much fun. It was much fun. I don't think it's on our, oh my god, this is much quotable, make me giggle kind of thing, but it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. There's not quite the wee wee moment. <laughs> yeah, but still, but still, it, it, it had its moments. It had its moments. So anyway, Silver, what are we going to do next week? Oh, well, it's back to MLP, but with an episode that's very special and near and dear for me. Oh. We will be talking about surf and or turf. Oh. Hippogriffs galore. <laughs> Yay, we get to see your hometown. Woohoo. Oh, oh, I see. Just because I'm a hippogriff, I must be from there. Oh, be kissed. <laughs> but it's true. Oh, well. Uh, so where is your character from? <laughs> from the space between places and the depths which mortal minds dare not to <laughs> trespass. Chicago? Or is it Florida? Detroit. <laughs> oh, no. Become human. Uh, well, yeah, if you go to Equestria Girls. But <laughs> that's next week. <laughs> yes. So, anywho, if you guys have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at admissionsgmail.com. You can also reach us on the Twitters. The show's Twitter account is Show. And as for me, I am Norman Sanzo. Silver, where can the good people find you? Well, I believe when... No, sorry, this is this will be up after PeroniCon. But you can find me at Crystal Mountain PeroniCon at the end of August in the Salt Lake City, Utah. Yay, another convention for you to catch Silver. And uh, you can always find me online, YouTube, at uh, Silver Quill or After the Fact. You can find me on Equestria Daily every Wednesday, posting a comic review, and you can find me on DeviantArt, where I will supply Pinkie Pie Says Good Nights, especially as Australia bombards us with double viewing weekends. Oh my goodness, how are you going to drink? Oh, wow. Thanks, Australia. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Twi- Twilight Genesis, I-, I see you. Thanks. Thanks, man. <laughs> Good day. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and also please subscribe and rate us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date, and stitch the radio, and also like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on PonyOfLive.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at Patreon.com. With every support, you'll get a week's early access to the review and discussion podcast, exclusive and deleted content, and a huge thank you from me. Talking about thank yous, I would like to thank LurkerCat, Starstream, Master of Like, Amy, Charles, Lucky Knight, and also Tristan. Thank you guys for being awesome. Just keep being awesome, man. And before we go... I want to say a huge thank you to LurkerCat for sponsoring this review and also congratulations on your engagement. Awesome on you. Oh, excellent. And here's the thing. I've talked to her about um, The Princess Bride and whatnot and she mentioned that husband-to-be never watched it and thought it was a chick flick. (laughs) Guess what happened then, Silver? Conversion. Yes. (laughs) So, yes, much awesomeness. Uh, but anywho, but anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Cecil Vaquil. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode of the MBS Show. See ya! 
as you wish. Inconceivable. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs>